Welcome to Work Life by Design. I'm your host, Mel Marsden. If the last few years have taught us anything, it's that change is inevitable and we no longer need to go to work to work. As a workplace dynamic strategist and the founder of Community, I draw back the curtains on my own business, the clients and projects that we deliver, along with tapping into the knowledge and insights from academics, business leaders and champions of change. I believe that our environments has the power to positively influence our behaviour and performance, inspiring our human potential. If I were to bring you together in a room of your peers and I asked you one simple question, who here would call themselves a creative? Chances are you're unlikely to raise your hand. And as my guests today describe, we often mistake creativity for artistry, the ability for us to draw or paint. However, many of us are actually practicing creativity every day without even realizing it. Maybe you like to sing, maybe you're great at cooking, maybe you're a problem solver. All of these are acts of creativity. Paul Fairweather and Chris Meredith are the two common creatives. Paul is a recovering architect, formerly the co-founder of the award-winning architectural practice Fairweather Proberts. He is also an artist, an inventor, and a property developer. Chris is a former marketing director. He is a speaker, writer, podcaster, and a business coach. And when he's not at work, you'll find him in, on, or under the ocean, and usually with a camera in hand. Together, they have combined their passion and pursuit of creativity to engage businesses to embrace theirs, helping their people create, capture, and communicate great ideas to solve business problems. Their goal is to make creativity as common as a loaf of bread and as well understood as common language. Now, for me, as someone who would raise their hand when asked if they were creative, I'm fascinated by this conversation as Paul and Chris share how they encourage people to unlock and embrace their creativity. In today's episode, we are going to explore the role of creativity in our professional lives, if in fact you can actually teach creativity, the common block or resistance to embracing creativity and why so many of us would fail to put up our hands in that room, and what they have learned and observed about how our physical environment can impact on an individual's creativity. As businesses are struggling to solve new problems in our fast-paced world, encouraging creativity in our organisations is a key to success. And Paul and Chris leave us with their thoughts on where we can each start. So without any further ado, please let me introduce you to Paul and Chris, the two common creatives. Now today I am joined by my guests, Paul and Chris, from the two common creatives. Welcome, guys. Thanks for joining me. It's great to be here. Really excited to be here, Mel. Thanks for inviting us. Now, Paul, you are a recovering architect. You're also an artist, an innovator, a property developer. Chris, you're a former marketing director. How did the two of you come together to create two common creatives? And tell me, what is it all about? Look, I'll start how we came together. So Chris and I were introduced by a colleague at the beginning of COVID. So we had a chat online and we we got on famously and we started doing many things together, but we didn't meet in person for about two and a half years and it was better in person, which was lucky. (laughs) But Chris, what did we, uh, what did we do? The reason we were introduced to each other is we both run our own businesses, kind of thought leaders, business practices, helping coach and train and inspire businesses. But this mutual friend spotted we had the same strange quirk, which is we're both artists in our kind of spare time. Paul's a successful watercolorist. He's actually been a finalist in the Archibald Prizes. I've never risen to those heights, but I'm a photographer and I post pictures every day online, which is my creative outlet. And this friend said, hey, you two are both equally weird. You've got to chat to each other. <laughs> and that theme of creativity in business has never left us. We, To this day, the podcast and the things we do are all about exploring creativity in business and helping people in the white heat of the workplace be more creative. So Mel, just to add to that, so what we did was when we first had our chat, we both were amazed at our knowledge about creativity. We said, oh, we should invite some people along to listen to our chats. So we did a few webinars where we were just talking about creativity and then we got a bit bored. So we thought we should ask some other people along and then we decided to turn it into a podcast. And so we're now up to, uh, I think we've published 76. So the Common Creative available 
on all good uh, providers of podcasts. Nice point. Good job. <laughs> Hurry, well, stocks last. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. But Chris, as a, a marketing director, I understand what you do is highly creative. You're helping people kind of express what their brand is and tell it in a meaningful way to connect to consumers and potential clients. And Paul, as an artist, I understand creativity there. And even as an architect, I get creativity, you know, being an interior designer myself and coming up with all those concepts and being inspired by the world around us and the people that are going to occupy those buildings. I understand creativity in those formats. And I'm curious to know, how do you think creativity presents itself in other professional settings? If a number of the listeners that are joining us here today are people and culture leaders, there might be some fellow designers, there are other C-suite executives, what role does creativity have in our professional lives? Look, I'm just going to kick off by saying that like, I'm an architect and you know, creativity in architecture, but I suppose the stepping off stone is, you know, I had a large architectural practice, about 50 people, and there's a lot of mundane tasks that you've got to undertake. You know, there's administration staff that aren't doing any design work, but even a lot of the staff are doing technical work rather than creative work, and there's really only one or two people to design. So in some ways, it's not a lot different, even in, in architectural firms, there's a need for greater creativity. But I suppose to just to answer the question, and it really is about people stepping into the unknown and doing something different, you know, rather than being analytical, rather than adding up the row of numbers and saying, well, that's the answer. It's actually about coming up with something something very different. The reason that it's important is in business is now more than ever, where we need to do things differently to come up with different ways of solving the you know immense problems that we have. In a way, we're kind of we're challenged in business ultimately to solve problems, and that is an act of creativity. But the dilemma we're all faced with is we tend to get promoted and we tend to get trained to follow the routine, to follow the rule book. Early in your career, doing what you're told is a great way to get to a certain level, and there comes a moment when following the rule book doesn't work anymore. And recently, last two or three years, the rule book's completely been chucked out the window. We've all got to solve problems in new ways. That means creativity. And I have a particular view that businesses are often hardwired to drive the creativity out of us. They don't know it, but they do things which just squish new thinking. So a lot of what we do is to, to encourage people to unlock their inner creative and to protect it from all those brutal systems, procedures, evaluation criteria, and destructive mechanisms that businesses have inside. All those check boxes that we need to be ticking that prohibit us from kind of exploring those, those edges. So when you go in and you start working with organizations and the people within them, what are some of the most common sort of resistance or comments that people are kind of putting out there going, oh, you know, I'm not creative because... Well, it's just that I'm not creative. And look, I actually show them my folio of work that I've done because I'm trying to intimidate them. Then I say, who's creative here? And no one puts their hand up. But even in the firm of architects, no one put their hand up. And then someone did. But the reality is, and the reason is because people think creativity is relative and it's not relative. And so people often say, I'm not creative because they know someone who's really creative. And they go, well, that person's creative, so therefore I'm not. So what I'm actually in, you know, the processes I go through and Chris does something similar is to show people that we're all creative and that it's not relative. It's not a competition. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if any of us on this call were to compare ourselves to other amazing creative people, then in our field, when we go, oh, well, I'm not creative because I'm, you know, not nearly as productive as that person or you know, I'm not nearly as inventive or clever or whatever it might be. So that's the first thing that I say, because people always say I'm not creative. And one example I have is a business man who was actually, he was a, a lawyer. He was the chairman of a large national firm sitting there in his pink jacket and bright green tie, telling me about all these amazing things he'd done. He'd start a winery and blah, blah, blah. And he said to me, I don't have a creative bone in my body. And I'm just looking in going, well, you're mistaking creativity for artistry. And that's one of the big things. And artistry is only a small part of creativity. And that was one of my questions. You just touched on it there. I think when you say creativity, and I think I made this mistake earlier on in my career as well, is that 
creativity is about your ability to draw, your ability to paint, but it's not. And I think Chris, you can kind of expand on that a little bit more for me. What are some other forms of creativity that aren't necessarily putting pen to paper? I challenge people who claim that they're not creative to describe what they do when they're cooking and there's a recipe and they've run out of one of the ingredients on the recipe. And the answer is, of course, you know, you head to the cup and look for something that's a bit like it and bung that in and hope for the best. That is itself is a reasonable act of creativity. You're problem solving. You're coming up with a new way of making a great dish, even though you haven't quite got what you need. So anything that's doing something new and different is an act of creativity. The problem with creativity is any creative act is a small act of bravery. If you're making a recipe, it might be that the recipe is going to go wrong. But in business, if you're going to say, look, I've got a better way. I've got this idea. Why don't we do it this way? There is a risk that your the people around you will go, well, that sounds like rubbish, or we have not done it before. What if it goes wrong? And straight away, people are attacking you. And if the environment in business doesn't support creativity in the right way, you'll learn, don't go there. Don't come up with new ideas. Follow the rule book. So one of the secrets of promoting a creative, kind of vibrant, innovative culture at work is to have a a culture where people are happy to listen to and build on new ideas. I'm not saying that people, you have to accept all new ideas and everything's good and therefore you the chaos ensues, but there have to be moments when you'll work with people around new ideas to help them build them up to something, which might be a good idea, might end up being a terrible idea, but you've got to help them build them and work with them. So how can you build that culture of creativity? Because is there such a thing as a culture with too much creativity and too much risk-taking? And what's the byproduct of that? (laughs) Yes, you're absolutely right. If you just have a creative environment, you have chaos, total chaos. Oh, let's do it this way. We'll do it this way. And I'm not going to do it what you say. I'm going to do what I say. And, and, you know, we've all seen situations when everyone's running off doing their own thing their own way. And yeah, yeah, you do not want too much creativity. The ratio is about 10% to 90%. You want about 10% of creative thinking, problem solving, brainstorming, all that stuff. And then you go into operational mode. How do we make this happen? How do we make sure it's a success? How do we tell people, whatever it might be, the operations side of it. So it needs to be put in its own little separate area. You don't just mix it up and hope that it kind of infuses everything. He said, now we're going to be creative. Now we're going to help ourselves to solve this problem in a new way. We'll explore new things. If we don't instantly know the answer, that's a good thing. We're going to wander around this a bit and mull in it and enjoy the not knowing, if you like. But there will come a time where we'll say, right, what's our best guess? Let's work out if we're going to implement that and let's be hard-nosed and commercial about things. So systems and processes still play a really big role in actually supporting creativity. I suppose what I'm hearing here is it's not about so much teaching people how to be creative. It's more about showing them a way to be creative and a way to be able to express themselves and use that in the context of work. There are tools to be creative, just like tools for writing a balance sheet. And if people feel really stuck, you can do A, you can do B, you can do C. And it's amazing what you can deliver with A, B and C. Boom. Well, there's so much that I want to add. And, but I just wanted to go back to a point, you know, you said about, you know, mistaking creativity and painting and drawing. And I just wanted to pick up on that drawing thing. And whilst artistry, you know, is not the whole creative story, drawing is a really important piece to it. Our brains are not wired to actually recognise words. We recognise language, but not words. And what we do is we see each letter as a little picture. And what happens, and back to, you know, the earlier discussion about people not having a creative bone in their body, you know, if you ask a room of six-year-olds who's creative, then everyone puts a hand up. You know, who wants to draw, everyone puts a hand up. But what happens, we lose it around puberty and we lose it around puberty basically because of lack of support or active discouragement from friends, peers, parents, teachers. And, you know, if we're not a brilliant artist, we have this vision ourselves when we reach puberty where we want to basically make things realistic. And so if we can't draw photographically, then we stop drawing. And I think it's a really big thing and it's a really important thing. So Chris and I both do things where we get people to draw in workshops because it's a different way of communicating and you get a different experience. And I think it's a way of, you know, if you're drawing, you're not necessarily being creative, but you're using a really basic primeval creativity tool will actually help lead creativity. One of our guests recently on our podcast, Nigel Marsh, made this great comment when he said 
he doesn't tell people or teach people creativity. He just focuses on a problem. He said, because to order to solve a problem, then you have to be creative. So it just comes with the territory. So he doesn't really focus on creativity. He says he has solved this challenge and then people are forced to be creative. That's a really interesting way of looking at it. And I want to take this on a little divergent for a second because, Paul, as a former architect, I'm guessing you probably share some of my similar frustrations, but what's your take on the ability of some of our newer recruits coming into our industry and their ability to actually draw with a pen and paper and create a design as opposed to jumping straight into a computer? So, look, I think it's really interesting, and uh, I'm just trying to think about parallels, you know, back to the business world, but I'm sure there are, are many. The thing is that when I learned to draw, in fact, on my very first day of university in, in the art class I had, we were told to draw trees. We weren't sent outside to draw trees. We were just told to draw trees. And I was drawing trees, and this, the teacher, the lecturer came up past me, and she just went, they look too architectural. And I thought, well, that's a good thing, isn't it? You know, I'm at a school of architecture. But no, I had to draw trees that didn't look architectural because they had to teach me how to draw architectural trees. But the point is that when I learned to do technical drawing, I had someone to show me how to do it in the office. But in that process, they also showed me how to draw and what to draw. So the problem we have now with the disconnect, and there's two things, two parts of this technology. One is the amazing rendering capability and the other is the technical tools. One of the big disconnects is the technical tools. The senior people aren't teaching them how to draw on the machine because they don't know. And so they're, therefore they're not having the opportunity to teach them what to draw. The second thing is that I think it's probably leading to a frustration because every first or second year student can represent and design these amazing buildings but they're not getting the opportunity to do it in the office because there's only one or two designers. And so I think it probably leads to a frustration. I think it really is about a, a disconnect between generations. And I think that probably in the end, it'll be a good thing because it means that these new generation have these incredible tools of how to communicate as long as they can be taught and learn what it is they're drawing rather than you know how to draw. So how did that creativity then come through in terms of other industries and the clients that you're working with? What role does creativity take in our work lives when we're an accountant or a lawyer? How does that actually come to life? It's interesting. I mean, both of us taught people like accountants, lawyers, financial executives and so on. And your instinct is, well, hang on, they're numbers people, they're rational people. But firstly, what you find out about them is in their kind of private lives, they're chefs or artists or poets or actors or singers or incredible people with kind of creativity bringing out of them. And the other thing I go back to is the point I made earlier, is that adding up numbers on a spreadsheet and doing what you do with a balance sheet, the human brain isn't needed for that. You can already do it on a spreadsheet. Pretty soon AI will do it completely without even thinking about it. What's needed is the ability to solve a problem. And as we've suggested, the problems businesses, and in fact, many organizations and people are facing these days are getting harder and harder and faster and faster. And that needs creative tools. You know, the old rule book doesn't work. How do I solve this for the first time? How do I define the problem in a clever way? And how do I allow myself to explore different ways of solving it before alighting on an answer. Neuroscientists talk a lot about how creativity works in the brain. And it's not just a gift. There are bits of the brain that work to be creative and there are bits of the brain that help you with reading and all those good things. And you have to know how to access those bits of the brain. In fact, let those bits of the brain flourish in order to be creative. So for example, it really helps to be in a good mood. And it sounds like fluffy Californian bullshit to say that stuff. But the science proves if you want creative thinking, be happy. And it could be as simple as mentally sing yourself a song that you enjoy before solving that knotty business problem. That simple technique will generate more creative ideas. And if you go, woe is me, we'll never fix this. What are we going to do about it? And are you finding that there's a more of a calling for the work that you're doing at the moment because of the number of problems that need to be solved? And I think I read a McKinsey study recently too, is that they're encouraging more design thinking to happen within organizations because those CEOs that are considering solving problems and doing it more innovatively and with more creative responses, they're getting better results. And they're seeing that on the actual balance sheet now as well. 
I think it's a case of some are on it and they want more of it. Others, you know, they don't know what they don't know. To sort of answer your early question and bring a couple of things together, basically one of the things that Chris and I did recently and I've been doing more often is I get the participants to do a, a watercolour of a lemon. And the reason I get a painting of a lemon is no matter how it turns out, it either, it's either a painting of a lemon or a lemon of a painting, one of the two, but it's a process. I think artistry or some sort of creative hobby or pursuit, and Chris mentioned before about you know singing a song or music, that is a gateway into creativity at work because unless you feel confident, because it's about building a creative confidence, and that might even lead to you being confident to put your hand up in a meeting to say, I've got, a, I've got an idea or I've got a thought on this. And if you've experienced that creativity in your own home, the safety of the home, and whether it's, I have one client that does extreme knitting and she's got six foot long knitting needles and she knits with rope. She's a lawyer and she's incredibly creative. I have this scale I call pragmativity. And one end is creativity, the other is pragmatic thinking. And no one ever lives on either end. You know, you asked the question before is, you know, what happens in these workshops that we do where we're being creative? Well, I just did this exercise for 25 miners in Marumba. And when I got to the point of telling them we're going to do a watercolour, it was a flash of white because all their eyes were rolling back in, in their heads. But in the end, I did it. They all engaged. And I had one guy come up to me. He said, I'm an electrical draftsman. I basically draw every day. And he said, this is the first time in my life. And he would be past middle-aged and he had his little painting of a lamb and he said, this is the first time I've ever drawn in pencil, let alone doing a watercolour. And he said, you know, I'm going to go home and this is going straight to the pool room, this one. You know, so I had a, one of my clients who was a financial planner, very successful, built and sold many different businesses. And he was raving about it. He's going, oh my God. He said, you have shown me, you've given me, you know, this confidence to approach things that I'm fearful of. And I'm going, oh my God, you know, we just did a watercolor of a bowl of lemons. So I know I keep on coming back to this, but I, I think it's the key. Whilst creativity is not artistry, artistry is a stepping stone. And I have a, another process which I call seed. S is, is the seed of an idea. That is for people to express themselves in the privacy of their own home creatively. Easy environment, which is about offices giving an environment where people can express their creativity in a group without the expectation of productive outcome. And then the other E is espalier, which is a, a grid that you grow plants on. And the idea of the espalier is every row is conformity, compliance, and control. So in every row is whatever your focus is. And the idea is to do an audit of those things to see where there are some gaps. So, okay, we've got to control all these things. We've got to comply with all these regulations and everyone's got to do the same thing the same way. But where can we have some gaps? And those little gaps is where we can find creativity. We say, okay, we've got a bit of a budget spare here. You knock yourself out. And if you get my case, it's lemons, you know, and they're all the stock standard Maya lemons over here on the left, on the right hand, you can graft in different things and you might get finger limes and tangelos and whatever. And if you get something you like, you can feed it back through the espalier, through the compliance control, things that Chris mentioned earlier, to take that idea and turn it into reality. So, you know, it's this thing about you know, whether it's 10, 15, 20%, I don't know what it is. But what happens is when you try to sell people, because they say, oh, we're accountants, we've got to control compliance and conform. But there's always a gap, you know, and it's in those gaps. What do they say in England? Chris, mind the gap. Mind the gap. <laughs> yeah. One of the challenges is that there is a fear, of, particularly amongst leaders, that you give people too much creativity and chaos will ensue. I can't have this. I'd, I prefer a command and control structure. I'm at the top. You follow my orders and do as you're told. I got here doing what I was told, so you're going to get further. And that model's changing. Yet there is more demand for what we do, but it's certain organizations. Others, I think, see creativity at best as a bit of fun on the side and at worst a threat to what they do. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And, um, and thank you for sharing your model there, Paul, because I think that framework helps people understand that there is a bit of a process and there is some structure to it that can support creativity. And to your point, Chris, that it does take away from having complete and utter chaos and helps mitigate some of those risks. I think that's another factor that many businesses are very fearful of is taking too many steps too far away from the norm because that fear of risk setting in and being quite risk adverse many organizations at the moment they're trying to stay as close to the path as they can because that's what they know what do our workplaces look like when we no longer need to go to work as organizations navigate a new frontier struggling to work out what's next in today's hybrid and distributed world 
How can we leverage one of our greatest assets, our workplace? My book, The Next Workplace, Designing Dynamic Environments That Inspire Human Potential, will show you how to leverage your workplace to attract and retain talent, increase employee engagement, and elevate employee experience, plus deliver bottom line returns on your investment. The Next Workplace is the ultimate playbook. It will inspire your thinking, show you how to unlock the data in your business, provide you with the resources to build your business case with confidence, and reveal the proven frameworks and practical tools to align, enable, and inspire the human potential within your organization. So to grab your copy and begin to reimagine your next workplace, head over to my website, melissamarsden.com.au forward slash book. What have you actually observed in terms of how space and how the environment, the physical environment, actually supports a person's creativity. Now, I know we had this conversation on your podcast, but I'm going to I'm going to turn the tables because I, I mean, I'm sure that you've been into different businesses and different organizations and you would have seen environments that are highly encouraging and supporting of this in the, the physical makeup. And Chris, I think you even shared an example when you were grilling me on your podcast about what wasn't working, but I'd like to know what also you found does work. And I just want to give you a very quick example, and this is really starting, and you said about turning the tables, and it's really about turning the tables or the round table. Basically, what I've discovered with Chris, and now whenever I do my workshops, it's always basically I try to get those standard blow tables where four people sit, and Chris and I did a workshop for TMR, and we arrived and they had six round tables that sat 10 people each those big round tables that have a banquets absolutely the wrong environment for doing what we want to do so we turn it into the smaller tables where people sit in pairs in groups of four and the amount of feedback and discussion that you get and engagement is miles away you know so it really is the rectangular peg not in the round hole or round table in this case. But here's a very simple example. And this is, we're just talking about a shape of a flat surface. The experience for the participants and even for the presenters in terms of trying to get feedback where people talk together at a table is remarkable. You know, you're in a room, who cares? Who cares what shape the table is? Who cares how many people are at a table? So there's just a very quick example with with skirting the bigger issues of, you know, design of spaces. Let me share... My little checklist, I feel a bit nervous giving you my sort of design tips to you, Mel. But first thing is if I arrive at a business and there's that gray slash beige color palette that we're all so familiar with, my heart sings because I think these poor people, they desperately need something to make them sort of spark up. I don't know where it came from, but somebody somewhere decided that offices have got to be dull, gray, neutral, beige palettes. And that kills creativity. So, so to stimulate creativity, that I've got some hard and fast rules, and be good to know whether you think I've got them right. The first is out of the window. You need to see nature. You need to see sky or water or green of trees and bushes. That kind of thing. If your window looks at another office block or something hard and cooked, that's terrible. That that kills creativity. So it actually matters what's out of the window. Secondly, the space that you create in has to have lots of freedom to move. And I have a particular thing about rooms being full of chairs. You need space for people to get up and walk and physically move, kinetic energy, if you like. So a room full of chairs and tables is a problem. Third thing that really helps is a sense of emptiness. A room that's full of stuff kind of says, oh, we've got the answer. We've got things already. You don't have to add anything. So actually a nice, clean, well-organized, empty room. That's not to say you couldn't have, oh, well, when we do kind of watercolor, we would pull, you know, there's some watercolors and some papers. On. But there's a sense, primarily, there's not much there. And what that signals to people in the room is, you got to fill it up with something. You're on the, in the spotlight here. And the last thing is provocative stimulus. You need stuff which people are going to go, oh, wow. It's kind of really make an impact on them. PowerPoint charts are probably the worst example. Very few people look at a PowerPoint chart and think that's so inspiring. But an actual chili pepper or a person who's spent their life rock climbing down Everest, those kind of things stimulate creativity. So to summarize there, we've got, Paul, you're talking about proximity. So the change in shape and size of table brings people closer together. So being closer together enables people to communicate better. 
you were talking about natural views and that ability to have access to nature and therefore our circadian rhythms and having that ability to connect with what's going on in the world outside. Colour, basic, given some people a bit more stimulation in that space. Freedom to move. I really like that one and particularly that concept of being an emptier space so that there's an opportunity for us to contribute because, like you said, if everything's really full, then we don't feel like there's much room for us to move. And then I like that provocative stimulus. So my final parting question for you guys, and you can both answer this in your own perspective, but if you were talking to an organization and trying to understand what it is that is going to inspire creativity in that organization, what would you say to those organizations about where to start? What would be the first thing that they should be considering about bringing more of this into their organization? The first thing is safety. Make it feel safe to contribute new ideas. And it could start with something really simple, like what ideas have you got? That sounds really interesting. I wonder how we could make that work. How about doing it this way? Building ideas, getting people feel safe at that. It could be, you know, that Monday morning meeting, can we, or what do you do at the weekend? And can we bring that in here? Start with the simple, easy stuff, but make sure you're rewarding and celebrating people who contribute ideas so that when there's a really difficult problem, people feel safe to go, do you know what? I think there's something we could do there. And they know they won't get squashed. Well, the first, obviously, is to bring Chris or I or even both of us in. But look, I would say about encouraging people just to be curious. And I just wanted to share a very quick story. I guess we have a podcast, Glenn Boyle. He was a real estate agent, done many different things in his life, very successful real estate agent. He was at his kid's six-year-old soccer party or something, got cornered by a mother who was a research scientist doing a PhD at university on cloning of coconut palms. Most of us have been going, right, oh my God, is that the time I'm out of here? But there was a story behind it and he was very curious. And so he went home, spent about an hour talking to this lady, went home and researched it. And it led basically to him establishing a multi-million dollar business because it's about replenishing the dwindling viable stocks of coconut plantations around the world. And there are millions and millions of trees or probably billions of trees needed. So my tip would be the first step is to get your people to be curious. Thank you very much, guys, for sharing your thoughts with us today. I'm particularly interested in this topic because I think as someone I consider myself to be naturally creative, it's always been in me to have the artistry and I think that then extends into creativity. But I think it's really important that everyone sort of taps in and sees that unique creativity within them because I think it has a lot of value that it can bring back into our businesses, our economies and our lives in general. So thank you both very much for sharing your thoughts with me. Thank you, Mel. It's been a huge pleasure talking about one of my favourite subjects. So I really appreciate the opportunity to share the thoughts. Yes, Mel, it's been fantastic to be able to doodle while I talk rather than take notes of sound bites and timestamps when we're hosts. So it's been fantastic being a guest and all the best with your book and look forward to reading it. Thank you very much, guys.